Uh, I'm a software developer, uh, primarily working with C Sharp as the main language. Uh, but I have a background from Haskell as well. And in fact, my first job coming out of university was doing full-time development in Haskell. Um, and it's been a really, really interesting journey to uh, go to C Sharp with a, a Haskell background. So uh, this talk will be about some of my experiences there. Uh, I've also been giving a number of talks at um, conferences for a general development audience, primarily for object-oriented uh, developers. Uh, where I talk about sort of my background in functional and uh, give a little introduction to, to Haskell and what the, the way you, you would write your code uh, with that style uh, for an um, object-oriented audience. Uh, but first, how many of you are C-sharp developers or are familiar with C-sharp? Okay, so a couple of you. I think perhaps this presentation will be more interesting if you don't have much background in C-sharp. Uh, but if you do, you might be able to recognize yourself in some of my experience from this. Uh, so let's start. Uh, I'll go back a number of years to... Um, um, to my early career when I was doing this Haskell development. Uh, I was doing that for a number of years and then uh, I switched to a different job where I was doing C++ development. At that point, I never actually had a job where I was doing object-oriented developments. I found this would be a very interesting uh, opportunity for me to, to really use that uh, or leverage that type of uh, development as well because I thought that's what people are really doing, right? Not many are doing functional development. So I want to have that experience as well. Um, and one of the first things I noticed when I came to C++ was the huge number of loops in those programs. They were all over the place, yes? Some of you are laughing here, <laughs> you recognize that. How many here are developing C++? Oh, there's a couple of you, all right. So the company I was working for, they were developing tools for um, uh, optimizations of the distribution of personnel on plane routes. Uh, so we would uh, have a lot of um, uh, logic that would be analyzing uh, plane routes. So you have trips um, uh, consisting of multiple legs. For instance, a trip going from Krakow to Paris, from Paris to London and back to Krakow. And we would take the whole timetable of, of uh, flights and try to uh, optimize that so we get these uh, nice loops and then get them as cheap as possible, save money. So in that code, you would see a lot of this type of structures. So the, this code was pretty old. It was actually developed originally in C, not in C++. It was related, turned into C++, but some of the code would still look like, uh, like C in many cases. So the trips were organized as linked lists. So we would have loops where we would start off with taking the first trip from all trips. Then as long as that trip is not null, we would just take the next trip and then we would do our work on each trip. And to make matters worse, we usually had to nest these because each trip consisted of multiple legs. So you'd be doing a lot of these constructs. We were just doing nested loops. Now, just before I joined the company, or a year or two before that, um, th this company had made a, a decision to introduce Boost, the Boost library. How many of you know what Boost is, C++? A lot of you, good, good. So what Boost say is that it um, provides peer-reviewed portable C++ source libraries. So it's actually a huge set of libraries, a lot of different algorithms implemented there. But there's uh, one construct that I very much enjoy, and that's the for each construct. So at this time, um, C++ did not have this structure natively. I believe they introduced something similar to that in later versions. But they didn't. Uh, so I want to use this in my code. Because with this construct, we could turn this into this, which I find much more easy to both write and read, because it's much more to the point of what we're doing. But immediately at that point, when we started considering introducing this as a code base, there was a pushback from the rest of the group, at least some of them. Not a hard pushback, but it was immediately the question of, should we really do this? I mean, we've already been doing these for loops forever, and they're working fine, and what do we really gain from this? We get all these dependencies coming in here. Should we really do this? I found that to be an interesting discussion, because for me, there's an obvious benefit for doing this. Yes, there are a lot of ways to do this in C++. You can do this with functions and all this, but this is a very concise way to do it. So fast forward a couple of years. I uh, moved to a different town, and I get the job where I am now, where I'm doing development in C Sharp instead. And the first thing I noticed when I came to C Sharp was the library called Link. Everybody here know what Link is? Yeah, I guess at least those who are doing C Sharp development must know that. This was a big relief for me, because, C because Link stands for Language Integrated Query, and it contains a lot of these higher order functions that I was so used to using in, in Haskell. So instead of map, we would use select, which take a function and apply it to all the elements of a set. Uh, there's a where corresponding to filter in Haskell. Very similar, it takes a predicate and just gives me the set of, of operations. This allowed me to write my code like this. 
So if I want to take all, get the names of all the employees in the R&D organization, I can just say oh, employees where organization equals R&D, select name, right? And I get that. Wonderful. So I really felt that, hey, I'm back in the, uh, the old days when I can do this very efficiently with just some functions on those. In fact, link includes a lot of these functions. So if you, course, if you look at the corresponding functions of Haskell, we can see there's a pretty good mapping of, of the different functions. So map corresponds to select, uh, concat map, select many, filter, take while, all, any, zip with, all of these functions that you're used to using for doing iteration, basically, or moving across sets of, of elements in Haskell are, are available here in this, uh, in this link library. Wonderful. So I joined the company, and the, um, the um, group I was working with was a group that were developing a, a C Sharp library, which is basically a wrapper for an API that we have that allows you to interact with our tool programmatically. <clears throat> and this uh, API uh, leverages uh, JSON RPC, remote procedure calls over WebSockets. So we just want to have a C Sharp layer that allows us to build all the JSON structures without going through the text uh, and doing it in a good, nice typed way. So you had, could do this in C Sharp. Um, and one of the things that we need to do that wasn't, hadn't been done yet uh, when I joined the group was to leverage the documentation we had for this, uh, for this uh, library. We already had a good documentation of what the system would support for commands. And we want to take that documentation and bring it into the C Sharp world so that we can get that documentation into Visual Studio um, and all those uh, benefits we get from having it there. So this was sort of a small isolated project. I was totally new to the company. I was totally new to C Sharp. So I found this would be a, a good thing for me to start looking at because I could sort of dabble around with it and play with it without making too much of a fool of myself, not, not knowing the language. So um, what I would do is we would have this documentation in HTML format for the, uh, for the, for the API definition. And I would uh, write a program then that would read in that HTML, parse it, extract the information I needed, and take that information and put it into the, the XML structure required by Visual Studio for, uh, for getting it into uh, to that domain. Uh, and I went back and looked at some of the code I wrote from, for this. And this is one example of a method I, that I wrote, or a function that I wrote. Uh, it's, at this point, I have scanned through the HTML. So I have a list of uh, method informations. So this is one page per method in the API, and I will extract that. And what I want to do is I want to take all the methods, group them into uh, which class they belong to. I use the group by, excellent function. This will give me a map of uh, a class and the different uh, method informations. And then I will update my XML, the target XML, with these groups. I found this to be a very natural way of writing it. So it's a nice sort of divide and conquer tactics. I do something with the large set and I have a function that, that does something with the individual elements at the end. This is a style of coding that I, I'm very, very comfortable with and it's, uh, I like it. But when my colleagues started looking at this code, they were very surprised. And they would start saying, hey, where are all the loops? <laughs> right? And it became, so as I said, I was working on this sort of by myself because it was sort of an introductory thing I was doing. And uh, that was perhaps both good and bad because I realized that the way I was using their language, because I was totally new to this, was radically different from what many of them would do. Not all of them, some of them were familiar with this, but others were not. And one of my colleagues started jokingly calling Mr. Lambda after doing it. So you can see these Lambda expressions <laughs> that appear from time to time here. Yeah? And they are, of course, used a lot and is a very central piece of, uh, uh, of tooling for, for doing these type of operations. So I realized that there was some form of communication miss going on here. And I had written a code in a way that they were obviously not familiar with. So we were having a, a stand up one morning. Uh, and I raised my hand and said, hey, I have an idea. Why don't I give you a little introduction to Haskell just to give you sort of a feel for, for my background on this? Probably partially as a defense speech, <laughs> it might be. Uh, but I think it would be an interesting learning experience as well. And they said, yeah, absolutely. Please do. So I built a presentation ar around that. And I've actually given that presentation at a, a number of conferences later as well. Uh, and what I did was, at that point, I needed to think about what is it I actually want to show from Haskell. Uh, and of course, this type of stream-based processing I'm doing here had to be a central part. So I started thinking about how to do that. And uh, um, a situation came to mind when I was doing the C++ uh, work. 
Uh, I had a colleague back then who was uh, curious about functional programming, and he uh, wanted to learn more about this and experiment with it. Uh, so, uh, and we talked about that, of course, and he wanted to do a small toy experiment, uh, or to toy tool with, uh, with it. And um, the problem he wanted to solve was the eight queens problem. So everybody know the eight queens problem? Classic lab exercise, I guess, yeah? Everybody in university has done this from one, at least once. Um, so place the queens on the, on the chessboard without any two queens uh, threatening each other, right? And uh, now when we started discussing this, um, <coughs> This, uh, this project, uh, the first question he had was, how would I model a two-dimensional array in Haskell? And I was like, uh, two-dimensional array? You could use lists of lists or something like that. Yeah, but you wouldn't get that constant lookup time that you would have in a two-dimensional array, right? No, you're right about that. Uh, I think there's some array implementation in the IO mode or something, but wait a minute, something wasn't really right there. And I was thinking, you know, I don't think you really need a two-dimensional array for this problem. And he said, yeah, yeah, but I want to do it this way now, so indulge me, right? I'll go with the, with the list with lists. All right. <sighs> and I was thinking about this problem and walking home from work that day. I was working in the middle of town. I was thinking about this, and when I came home, I sat down on my computer, and I wrote a solution that was radically different from what he came up with. I don't know if he actually completed it, but it was definitely a totally different approach from, from he, the way he was going. And I took a step back, and the first question I asked myself was, how do I represent the solution to this problem? I did not want a two-dimensional array. Instead, there was one thing I could immediately know about the solution to this. That would be that there would be exactly one queen per column, right? There has to be. So why don't we instead represent the solution as a list, a list of integers, where each position represents the row in which that queen is at that given column. So the solution you are seeing here would be 3, 1, 7, 6, 2, 5, 7, 4, 0. That's the solution to the problem. So what we would do with this? Well, my thought was that let's start with some sort of partial solution. At least, actually, we'll start with the empty solution, right? We replace no queens in the board. And we'll fill up the board from the right, one queen at a time. So this part of the solution here will be 7, 4, 0. We replace three queens. Now we want to extend this solution. And the way we do this, we will try all positions, eliminate the ones that are not OK to add. So we end up with 1 and 5 in this case. And then we'll build our new extended solution by just appending these values to the original solution. Well, we get these two solutions. All right. But if we do this, then we can just keep applying this extension over and over again. And in the end, we have added eight queens. And we can just take, first, take the first solution, and we're done. And the solution I ended up with is this. That's pretty short. Actually, when I've given this presentation at different conferences, so I'm always very happy when I come to this slide, because there's a real surprise effect in that. Because I spend that talk when I'm talking about first Haskell and those features uh, and all the thinking behind this and how you end up with this. And I'm not going to go through the solution in detail, but, but here is the function that extends the solution. It takes a partial solution's input, the queens, and here you can see I create those eight different positions, zero through eight, three, zero through seven. I filter out the ones that are okay to add and append them to the partial solution. And how do I do okay to add? Well, I can split it into three cases. One for the diagonal up, one for the diagonal down, and one for staying on the same level. And if all of those are okay to add, given a direction, then it's okay to add. And how do I express the direction? By a function. A function how to iterate from that starting position. And the function will just be the successor, the predecessor, and the ID, the id function. Those beautiful, small, fundamental build blocks of the functional world, right? I'm always very happy when I can use those. <laughs> And that's, that way we end up with a solution like this, which is radically different from what he did. So I was giving this presentation uh, at the conference in, in Oslo at some point. Um, it was probably, probably not in Oslo, but somewhere else. Um, and I was giving this slide and I was taking questions at the end and this guy raised his hand and he said, is it important that you're short? I got one red vote for that presentation. I think that was him uh, because he obviously didn't. 
Um, and I was sort of taken aback by that question because I hadn't really thought that through. Looking back at it, I probably should have because it's an obvious question for this, but I hadn't. What do you think? Is it it's important that it's short? How many think? Yeah, that's one. Yes and no, yeah? So I've been spending a lot of time thinking about uh, that and that question. And I sort of tend to agree with you. It's important that it's short, but it's absolutely not important that it's the shortest. Absolutely not. There's a golden middle ground here. In fact, I have a lot of extra wording here. As you can see, from, from those of you who are Haskellers, you can see that I'm one of those who likes to add the type signature for all my functions. I think that's a good way to document what the functions are. Actually, that's typically what I read when I read my code. But I can easily remove that. And it's much, much smaller, right? And I can continue like this. I can inline some functions. I can remove some redundant space, and I can fit it in a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad that you're laughing, because this is bizarre, right? This is not good code. I would be better off sending this to like a comp code obfuscation uh, a competition than sending it through a code review into the mainstream, right? So where is the middle ground? And why do I like this solution? And he didn't. And I think this comes back to another reaction I had to this solution, which was the first time I gave it to my colleagues, which was basically, we were looking at this and thinking, wow, that's short, and, but I can't read that. And why was that? That also made me thinking. And I think the main reason was that those engineers were very skilled developers. They did not have these higher order functions in their vocabulary. The way I do iteration here is so different from what they were doing. In fact, I'm spraying the solution with these operations. It's all over the place. Map and filter and all and everything. If you are not comfortable with using those structures and thinking about dealing with sets of elements in that way, then this is hard to read. To me, this is a very natural way to write it, and I'm very comfortable using these functions. So, so I, I like that approach, but for other people, this would be hard. So I'm going to talk a little about this type of stream-based processing, because there's, there's a very interesting twist to it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have in, in C-sharp this link library. A link library, uh, as I said, the link stands for language integrated queries. A link actually comes in two different flavors. So we have a method syntax and a query syntax. The method syntax is what I've shown you so far. So we have this uh, operation on employees where I will want the name of, uh, of all the employees in the uh, RD organization. But the query syntax looks like this. This does exactly the same thing. And this is more like the code you would write when interacting with a database. This is much more like SQL. I'm not a particularly experienced SQL developer, so to me, this is very hard to read. But if you go to Microsoft's documentation, this is an excerpt from the overview section on the introduction to link. What they say is that any query that can be expressed by using query syntax can also be expressed by using method syntax. However, in most cases, query syntax is more readable and concise. I don't agree with that. And they continue and say that, as a rule, when you write link queries, we recommend that you use query syntax whenever possible and method syntax whenever necessary. I don't agree with that either, obviously. In fact, if I were to encounter code where this was the default coding style and every uh, set operation was done like this, I would have a hard time reading that code. I would not be very comfortable with it. I have to think harder about what is going on where and how is it tied together. It's okay for small things like this, right? But if you're doing more advanced stuff, it quickly becomes hard for me at least. And I was very surprised when I saw this part of the documentation at Microsoft. So this is sort of their official view on how to deal with, with these operations in, in C Sharp. Uh, and I was very surprised mainly because I think there's an obvious obvious merit, or, or this method syntax has an obvious merit of its own. I like that style of coding. And I think a lot of people do that. And I mean, I, I tried to do some research on, uh, on Stack Overflow, just search for different uh, um, topics relating to this to try to figure out how many would be using this syntax over or the method syntax. It's hard to do that in a reasonable time, but it took me actually a while until I found a discussion that was using this syntax, query syntax. And in that first hit I got, after a few comments, it turned into method syntax. 
I don't know, that was a very unscientific way of research I did. So if someone wants to delve into that and see how that is used, that would be really interesting to see. But I, but I think that the, the method syntax is really, that is probably the most common way to use this library. And C-sharp is not the only language taking this into account. Java has also introduced a library called Stream, which is doing pretty much the same thing. I don't know how many Java developers there are here. Yeah, a number of you, good. So Stream was introduced uh, uh, not too long ago. Uh, they introduced the allowed uh, uh, Lambda expressions in Java in 2015 or something, I think, I don't remember. Uh, but it has the uh, same type of methods, uh, pretty much a one-to-one -one correspondence. Map, flat map, filter, all match, any match, and so on. So I think this is a style of programming is definitely taking, taking hold in many areas uh, and it's, uh, it's being used widely. There's an interesting thing here as well because when you look at these libraries, both Link in C Sharp and uh, the stream library in, in Java, there's one operation on lists that is missing that is used all the time in Haskell. That is the cons operator. The cons operator does not exist in C Sharp or in link, the basic library is there. In fact, the way you would typically do it is like this. If you want to append an element to the front of a list, you would create an array with one element and concatenate it to the list. I mean, we could be having something like this. You could uh, discuss the naming here if you want to have append or whatever, uh, but you could write like this, right? And to me, there's an obvious benefit of doing that. Of course you want to do that. If you want to add one element, you want to express that you're adding one element. But if you go into the threads, because other people are requesting this as well, someone requests that, hey, you shouldn't, we have a cons operator in, uh, in C sharp, and immediately there's someone say, yeah, why do we need that? We can do it with the, with the array, right? That's just an overhead. Why do you want such a thing? But to me, it's so obvious that it's better to use cons compared to that, just like it's obvious that you don't want to write this when you can write this. Just shorter, better, to the point, expresses exactly what you want. But I think it's the same type of pushback that people are just used to doing it this way. And they don't really see the benefit of it. And if you go to Haskell, for someone with a Haskell background, I mean, can you even imagine Haskell without the cons operator? This is the way we do it in Haskell. That's a one character operator and we use it all the time. So, let's turn back to this list. This is the list of different uh, higher order functions in Haskell and their correspondence in C Sharp and Java. And I would like to focus on the last one here, the iterate. <clears throat> so iterate is a little different from the others. Yeah, everybody knows what iterate does? Okay, so iterate is a function, uh, takes a function and an element, and it returns a list where the first element is the element itself. The second element is the element with uh, the function applied once. Uh, third element is the uh, element with the function applied three times, and so on. An interesting thing about that function is that it is, in essence, representing or creating an infinite list. There's no end to it. You can apply that function how many times you want. And in order to do something like that, you have to have some sort of lazy evaluation. And this is another concept that is quite novel if you go to an, an object-oriented domain and have an object-oriented set of users developing. Because they're not used to that. They're using their loops and dealing with the data one at a time. But with lazy evaluation, you can have these type of, um, of infinite, uh, infinite lists. And C-sharp supports this. <clears throat> so for those of you who are familiar with C-sharp, I'm sure I used the yield keyword at some point. So C-sharp introduced back in 2005 already, actually, uh, C-sharp 2.0, uh, the concept of deferred execution, which is basically a way of creating uh, um, a set of data. So you would have a function that will call an operation yield. At that point, it will pass the, uh, um, the control, uh, execution control back to the calling function. And that will keep running until it requests the next element. And then the, the, uh, the stream producer would, would continue its work. So with this uh, feature, you can implement iterate in C sharp. You would do something like this. So iterate would have, um, uh, returning an ionumerable. And it will have a function as argument and the starting element. And then we'll basically write a loop. So while, true, so forever, we would yield return x. So when we call this, it will be returning this value, sending it back, and whoever called it would um, do its processing, and when it wants the next element, 
it will go back here and continue off at this point. And after this, we would just apply f at x, reassign it to x, and just do the loop. Then we can treat this as an infinite list in the C-sharp. So I'll give you a, a small toy example uh, of how, how this can be used. So uh, the C versus Tostinus, everybody knows that. We are producing primes. We start off with the infinite list of all, uh, all numbers, starting from two. And then we just send off this is the C function. We return the first value, which is a prime, two is a prime. Then we remove all duplicate multiples of that in the, in the list and just recurse. The next time around, we'll be returning three. And the next time around again, we will not be returning a four because that's a multiple of two and so on. We get the primes. And the interesting thing is that we can treat now primes as an infinite list of all the primes. So in C sharp, we could do something like this, right? I already show you iterate. So iterate would start off with the value two and we would increment that for each uh, application. Then we'll apply sieve to that. And sieve, again, would just be an infinite loop. While true, start by returning the first number, which is a prime. P, take the first of the ints, yield return that one. And then once we've done that, we will eliminate all multiples of that value from the list. So we'll take all the ones where this is different from, so the um, <clears throat> modulo is different from zero. And then we'll just go around. And just like in Haskell, we can now have primes here representing the infinite list of ints. And I'll show you a case where I actually use this type of, of processing in, in real life. Uh, and in order to explain it, I need to talk a little about what the product we are developing is doing. So uh, Click is in the business intelligence industry. So do, do we develop tools for data visualization? This is a typical screenshot you, you would see where we have a map, we have some uh, bar charts, you can align charts and tables and so on. Um, and we need to support pretty big data sets. So you could have tables, as long as you have tables that are in this size, it's okay. But if you run into like thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions, hundreds of millions lines, then it quickly becomes hard. And we need to support that. We need to support huge data sets. Hundreds of millions of lines of, of data is not too uncommon. So in order to do that, we need to have some sort of pagination mechanism. We need to be able to page through the data because you can't really suck it in all at once. Actually, you never need to suck it in all at once because if you're looking at a table, you will only be seeing what's on the screen, right? So you only need to look at those parts. So, uh, and we were developing this uh, C-sharp API for dealing with this um, uh, with interaction with, the, uh, with our tool. <clears throat> and uh, we were uh, contemplating introducing a, a specific class for handling this operation, a pagination class. And this class would uh, contain a number of operations that you typically would use for collecting data from the system. Um, and for instance, this pager uh, pagination class would have to have function for going to the next page and so on. So we would introduce a function that will take a page representing a, a rectangle of data you want. So it could start up from top left, zero, zero, and 10 columns, right, and 20 rows, something like that. And if you want to go to the next page, well, then we just want to clone that page and assign the top value to the page to be just the incrementation with the height. We, so if you take the first 20 rows and start off at uh, position zero, then we'll start off at, uh, um, at the 20th row, right? And go uh, 20 rows down from that. And likewise, we would have a previous operator that would go to the page before if you want to go backwards in the data. And now that we had these operations, we could uh, do a loop across data like this. So we could start off taking the first page from the system. And then as long as the top of the page is less than the total number of rows in the data, then we would get our data, we get data. This is a call that will send off a, a JSON RPC message to collect the data for this page. And we can do our processing of the rows in that data set. And we will do our work. And when we're done, we will get the next page. And we'll just loop like this. So this is a sort of a basic application of this class. Um, but I also the opinion that this is the type of iteration you'll probably do a lot with the data. This is sort of the fundamentals of doing pagination, that you want to go scan across different pages. So I introduced this function in the class. It was actually me who developed this class, so I, I did this uh, no matter what the other people said. <clears throat> so iterate pages takes a function, which is a page transform, and a starting page 
And then what it does is that it iterates this function on the page. So this creates an infinite list of pages, conceptually. I'll take the ones that are in range. So as long as they are in range, and in range here, it's fine that any part of the page is within the, the table, uh, I think that would work. So depending on which way you were, you were moving, it, um, it will stop once you were outside the scope of the data. We'll take the ones that are in range, and then for each of those elements, I would do get data. And get data, that's the um, uh, side effect uh, centric thing that will actually send something over a web socket and such, right? This you can do in, uh, in C sharp because it's unpure. Haskell, this will be harder. So, with this operation now, with this function, I could write my data collection like this. So, if I want to iterate across all the pages, I will just say iterate pages, page next, that's the transform that goes to the next page, moves down across the table. Start page is a starting page I started with, I showed you earlier. So this will give me a list of all the data pages. Each page is a matrix of rows. And then if I want to do something with the individual rows, well, I will just concatenate them all. In C sharp, you would typically do something like this. Select many, I'm just applying the identity function actually, which will concatenate all of them into one. So this now becomes one big, uh, conceptually, one big list of elements or, or rows within the system. And then I can just iterate across them like this. So for each row in all the data rows, I will do my work. And the interesting thing about this is that as this loop is working across the data set, from time to time, it will reach the end of one of these pages. And at that point, that function will be called. It will stop for a while, send off that message, get the new set of data, and then continue if nothing ever happened. And it's totally transparent to the user. I kind of like that. I think it's a very nice way of, of dealing with this type of data structure. But this function that I introduced, the iterate pages, is also something that my colleagues were a little skeptical about. <laughs> Should we really have a function like that? That's that a little advanced, too functional? I don't know. But I said, yeah, I think we should do that. Now, it's always hard to know how much of um, what you're implementing, implementing in any tool that is actually being used by the end user. <clears throat> And especially with dealing with API, it's really hard to know what people are using in terms of the functions you are providing. We have some sort of, um, we have a number of different channels that users can use for contacting us and, and asking questions about the different parts. So we have a, a specific uh, Slack channel actually where people can post questions on, uh, on SDK usage, usages like this. And I do see that people are using them from, from time to time. And at one point we got a very interesting uh, support issue which was that uh, a user was trying to use this iterate pages, and it would see that, hey, I'm running this, but it's really, really slow, and it's consuming so much memory. What's going on there? How can I do this more efficiently? And I was thinking about, what? what? What is he doing? Is he doing some processing and bringing it all into memory? Why is that? It shouldn't be like that. So I went back to look at my code, and I was ashamed. <laughs> because I had done this. <laughs> you can see what the problem is? I added the two lists at the end. And that totally breaks everything. Because at that point, it will remove all lazy evaluation. It will all become strict. So that two list operation would actually force you to get all those millions and billions of lines into memory. And that was what we were seeing. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so I quickly said, hey, you can do this instead. It'll probably be better. And of course, I removed that tool list from the API immediately, and memory just dropped like a brick, and performance was much, much better, and he was so happy. Yeah. So if you want to ever want to know what people are using in your API, you can add bugs like this, and you'll figure it out. <laughs> it's always nice when you can do a, a small change and see these type of um, <coughs> big changes to your performance. OK. Um, I'm pretty much coming to the end of my, my talk here. Uh, just a, a small summary. Um, so one of the main interesting things that I found was, was this sort of language confusion that I sometimes have with my colleagues. Um, and I wanted to keep that barrier in mind. So if you're coming with a functional background, working with a highly object-oriented uh, engineers, then keep in mind that you might not be really talking the same language here. 
And many of these languages are bringing in uh, functional, um, functional components or concepts that are originating from the functional world, like C Sharp, Java, and JavaScript as well. I think there was talk earlier today about that. Uh, and I think it's really nice. Please use it. I would love to see that you use more. But also keep in mind that if you do, make sure you discuss this with your colleagues. Because it's not always obvious to them how this is being used, and how it could be used, and when you shouldn't use it, and so on. That's important to keep in mind. And especially if you try doing something more advanced from the functional worlds, like using monads. Say the word monad to an average object-oriented developer, and he would just go, huh? Right? Any questions so far? Here. That block over there it looks so much nicer than this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> How many agree? Oof. <laughs> How many disagree? A couple of you, okay. <laughs> I know it. And monads in C sharp and the link query system is, has some interesting parts. Yeah. Yeah. But this particular experience is Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. As I said, I'm I'm not from that background. So to me that's uh, that's a, a novel technique and something that I'm not used to. But I'm I'm sure you will have uh, encounter people who have absolutely that uh, uh, that perception of how to leverage this. And that's, that's an interesting discussion to have as well, when to use what. So I have a little time left, so I'll just give a, a short other anecdote that I also found, found useful um, or found interesting. Because I said I was giving this type of, this presentation about this eight queens problem, like giving out a number of conferences. Uh, and I was at the speaker dinner for, um, for one of those conferences, the one in, uh, in Oslo actually, uh, NDC. And um, <clears throat> uh, they had this functional track. Uh, so uh, the, the guy organizing the functional track would say, hey, can't we get together for the, uh, uh, for the dinner and we'll uh, find some, uh, some, some spot where we can talk and chat. I said, yeah, absolutely, that's nice. So I, I don't have too many colleagues that are in the functional domain, so I find that would be an interesting place to discuss functional topics. And uh, I was talking to one of the guys and I was asking him, you know, what do you use when you're, when you're developing in Haskell? What do you use for debugger? And his reaction was, debugger? <laughs> well, that was really surprising to me. Because being used to working in the C-sharp environment with Visual Studio, ReSharper, and all those fantastic tools surrounding that, the value of using a debugger is so obvious. And he was from a totally different perspective. I don't know if he had to use a debugger in his life. I'm not sure. <laughs> I kind of think he hasn't, because if he had, he wouldn't react like that. And that is actually one of my main reasons for not advising people to, to deploy Haskell. And that is the tooling around it. I, I must be fair, I haven't really done a good research on what the state of it is right now. But I have never seen anything on Haskell that corresponds to what I've seen as tooling surrounding C Sharp. It's just amazing what you can do in C Sharp with, with Visual Studio, refactoring, and you know, jumping between types and all of this, it's, it's just so handy. And debugging. It's really, really nice. And I was very surprised to see that part, that, he, that, that from the functional community, this guy was not at all in uh, agreeing with that. Okay. Any last questions before we wrap up? Well, thank you first for the talk. More queries index? No, no. So, <laughs> so my background is I'm actually a C sharp guy. I've been doing C sharp for yonks, yeah. and I work for Microsoft. And I, I wrote Q sharp, which is yeah. a quantum language, um, and we have F sharp as well. And in whenever I run into a situation like this, where I try to introduce the functional concepts, I find it easier to actually use F sharp. Uh, as the sort of gateway drug into FP, if you want to think of it like that, 
rather than try to get people to change their idiomatic C sharp thinking in C sharp itself. Have you, what are your thoughts on that? Like, why would you not just use F sharp instead? So, uh, I don't have, I have never used F sharp myself. Unfortunately, I would love to do that, but I have never really had a chance to, to begin to it. Uh, but we were developing uh, this, well, first of all, they have already started, this was a project ongoing when I joined, so I didn't really have an opportunity to, to influence that. But I think even if we did, we were not targeting, uh, we were targeting the average engineer for using this. And I, th I think we would have a much smaller uh, group that we could, uh, could access if we were using this in, in F sharp than, than in C sharp. That's just uh, um, what I think. And we didn't have any experience within the company for using F Sharp. So I think it would be a big learning curve anyway for deploying that. Uh, but I agree. Uh, starting from scratch, I would love to try to do this in F Sharp. Uh, that would be very interesting to see what the difference would be. I'm pretty sure the code would be much, much smaller than what it is today. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's actually one of the things about F Sharp. I would love to try it because I would like to investigate the tooling around it and see what you could do there with, uh, with debuggers. Yeah. Is there a debugger for Haskell? Does anyone know? No? What yeah, what for? <laughs> Why on earth do we want that? <laughs> yeah, any other questions? No? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.